We have to stop the insanity that's been going on here in the Middle East and particularly with the Arab-Israeli conflict for so many years. And I'm referring to the definition of insanity, which you might have heard is repeating the, the same mistakes over and over again and expecting different results. Now, there are some people that attribute that quote to Albert Einstein. If you look online, it actually is not clear at all that it was actually Albert Einstein who said that. But what is clear is that it's very fitting for the continuous obsession with the two-state solution. Uh, at least for 25 years, if we're not going back to the partition plan of 1948-49, at least for the past 25 years since the Oslo Accords, the left wing in Israel and the international community have been obsessed with the two-state solution. Uh, it's the only thing that's been on the table diplomatic diplomatically speaking. It's uh, the only plan that anybody is willing to even uh, discuss or, or consider. And it's a big mistake, and, 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 and we've been repeating that mistake. And it's been called, there have been various iterations of it. Originally, it was called the Oslo Accords. At one point, they called it the Tenet Plan. Uh, later on, it was uh, the Annapolis Convention. But it was all the same big mistake. And before I get on to what the alternative should be and can be to bring real peace to the Middle East and to Israel, I'd like to just explain uh, succinctly why it was such a colossal mistake and why it hasn't worked. Uh, it's based on the paradigm called the land for peace paradigm. And the land for peace paradigm really couldn't work for two, uh, in, and specifically in Israel's case, for two big reasons. First of all, when you, you're advocating land for peace, uh, it means that one side of the conflict wants land and the other side is the one that wants peace. The Palestinians were saying, give us self-definition, give us land, give us guns, and then we'll be able to live alongside you peaceably. And the big question or the, the, the loophole in the logic there is, what do you need guns and self-definition if all you want is peace? If you want to live co and coexist peaceably alongside the Israeli society here in the land of Israel, then we'll give you peace for peace. If they were offering, let's just put down our guns and see how we can economically share this land, then we would know that we have a true partner. But from day one, they said land for peace. So that's, that's number one. That's the one, first reason why it couldn't work or didn't work. Uh, number two is specifically Arab-Israeli conflict here in the Middle East, when you look at the land, when they're asking for land for peace, my question to you is, what land? You look at the map of the Middle East, you look at how small, tiny island the land of Israel is in the ocean of Arab and Muslim countries, and they're asking us to give a, another sliver, the heartland, the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, to them for peace? Again, look at the map, and you'll be astonished to see. I don't even know if you know these numbers. They have, the Arab and Muslim countries around Israel, have 567 times the amount of land that we do. I'll say it again. 567 times the amount of land that Israel has, even with Judea and Samaria. If you want to compare it to the size of, Amer of the United States of America, the United States of America is 400 times the size of Israel. Compare it to the state of Texas, the state of Texas is 28 times the size of Israel. So really, what are we talking about? What land is there for us to give them if all we're left with as the Jewish homeland after the Holocaust, the only homeland of the, the Jews in the whole world, is this tiny parcel of land? Uh, before I go on, I'd like to tell you a, a funny story I heard about the, the size of the country. Because two uh, leaders who became the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Israel, but before they did so, I'm talking about Ariel Sharon, who was the Foreign Minister under Benjamin Netanyahu's government, first government in 1998, was hosting Governor of Texas, George W. Bush, here in Israel, trying to explain to him exactly what I'm saying to you now, how small Israel is and what it would mean to give up Judea and Samaria to the Palestinians. In order to do so, he took him up in a helicopter, and it was very apparent from above how small things are, and he showed him that if we give Judea and Samaria to the Palestinians as they're demanding, there will be only nine-mile waste between uh, what is Judea Judea and Samaria, the Palestinian state, and the Mediterranean Sea, nine, nine, nine mile waste. And George W. Bush, Senator Bush at that time, coming from Texas, 
said, nine miles? We have driveways in Texas that are longer than that. So that just shows you a comparison of what we're up against and why I feel that the, the, the two-state solution could have never succeeded. And you know what? Even if you wanted to give peace a chance, you were from the left wing, the international community, said, let's, let's try this thing. We've tried it for 25 years. It failed miserably. It failed both the Palestinians and us. And continuing to try to walk down those roads is no longer realistic. For one reason, because there's 500,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria now. The settlers, like myself, I live in Neve Daniel and Gush Etzion. We're half a million by now. We're not going to uproot those settlements and make Judea and Samaria Yudin so the Palestinians can have their state west of the Jordan River. So the two-state solution is no longer viable, no longer realistic. We have to get on to a new page. And the left has been so wrong about this. You know, my mentor, the late Israeli uh, minister of tourism, Rabbi Benny Elon, used to say about the Middle East that in the Middle East there's no right and left. There's only right and wrong because the left wing has so, been so wrong and for so long about this. And the plan that he came up with is the one that I'd like to explain to you. It's called the Israeli Initiative, The Right Road to Peace. And it has three basic tenets. First is that we have to extend Israeli sovereignty to all, to all of Judea and Samaria, meaning completing what was done uh, after the 67 Six Day War in the Golan Heights and Eastern Jerusalem, do the same with Judea and Samaria. The second basic tenet is the rehabilitation and relocation of the Palestinian refugees living in Judea and Samaria and the Gaza Strip. And the final tenet is reaffiliation of the Palestinians living in Judea and Samaria with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Those are the three basic tenets of the plan, and now I'll elaborate and answer, I'll try to answer questions that I think will be coming, popping up in your mind. Um, let's go back to the first. Extending sovereignty. This is what you do when you go to war. And we were forced to go to war against all odds and with divine intervention, uh, this being our biblical spiritual home, we were able to overcome just like the Jews did in all of their history. Um, we shed lots of blood over the lands that we liberated in 1967, Judea and Samaria, the Golan Heights, uh, Eastern Jerusalem. And... Uh, in any conflict in the world, when you go to war and you're threatened and you win, those areas then become yours. Especially in a case like ours where historically and biblically and spiritually we also have laid claim to uh, the heartland of Israel, which is Judea and Samaria. Now, the Israeli government went and did the next logical step legally extending sovereignty over the Golan Heights, which up until that, till the 67 war were not under our control and Eastern Jerusalem as well. But they didn't do so with Judea and Samaria. They left Judea and Samaria in limbo uh, with its legal status being unclear. Now that situation has been going on for 50 years. Uh, just as a side note here, let's remember that the only occupation that has gone on in Judea and Samaria was done by the Jordanians. The Jordanians occupied Judea and Samaria in 1948-49 when we had the War of Independence, and they were able to take control of those areas. And we liberated those areas from Jordanian occupation in 1967. And we've had control of Judea and Samaria for 50 years. So they were only there for 19 years. The Palestinians, as Palestinians, were never there as an entity. And we've been there for 50 years. So the Israeli initiative says, enough is enough. We have to get to the next stage, extend Israeli sovereignty over all of Judea and Samaria. But then we, are, we immediately are asked the question, then we have two million Palestinians living there. What will be their status? Which brings me to the next two uh, tenets of the plan. One is rehabilitation and relocation of the refugees. I don't know if you've, if you've read up on this, but the refugee situation in the Palestinian world is totally, ano totally anomalous to what goes on in all other conflicts in the world. Uh, the, the UN, the international community, set up the, U the UNRWA, organization as their relief organization, whereas in any other conflict, uh, re uh, refugees are dealt with by the UNHCR, which is the organ, the relief organization of, uh, uh, of the UN that takes care of refugees. And what is its mandate? Its mandate is to relocate and rehabilitate from three to five years. And that's it. There was a war, people were displaced, they were refugees. Within three to five years, the international community steps in and solves the problem. The Palestinians begged to be dealt with differently. And the world, 
if you ask me stupidly, agreed and set up this UNRWA organization which doesn't relocate and rehabilitate, it only perpetuates the problem by kicking billions and billions of dollars each year into the coffers of UNRWA, uh, which only gives education and doesn't do anything about really solving the problem. So we have to stop that. that under the Israeli initiative, the world has to stop giving money just to perpetuate the problem. They have to make it uh, dependent on rehabilitation and relocation so there are no more Palestinian refugees within three to five years. And the last issue is the reaffiliation of the Palestinians living in Judea and Samaria with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and this would be the answer to what will be their national status. When I say reaffiliation, I'm referring to the fact that the Palestinians were Jordanian citizens, meaning they lived in Judea and Samaria, but they were affiliated with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, east of the Jordan River, up until 1988. Meaning even though we liberated Judea and Samaria from the, Palestinian, from the Jordanian occupation in 1967, those Arabs living in Judea and Samaria continued their affiliation with the Hashemite Kingdom up until 1988, many years after 67. Why did it stop in 1988? Because the previous king, the king of the current king, King Hussein, who was the king at that time, Arafat approached him and said, this is bad for the Palestinian uh, claim in the international arena that we need our own self-definition. Please sever the affiliation between us and you because we want to appear in the international arena as homeless, as not having the ability, not having a passport, not having any nationality. We want our own self-definition, and as long as we're affiliated with Jordan, we're not getting that kind of attention. King Hussein did what Arafat asked of him, and lo and behold, four years later, we have the Oslo Accords, the beginning of the modern two-state solution. So Arafat was correct in, on his part on asking for that, and we have to go back to the situation where they are part and parcel of Israel. They will be residents, because we've now extended sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. They will be our residents. But affiliated or reaffiliated with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, that's where they have their national rights, meaning that's where they vote. They won't vote for the Knesset, even though they're residents of the state of Israel, but they'll vote for the parliament in Amman in Jordan. They can either take a four-hour bus ride to Amman and vote physically, or they can do what I do when I vote in the American elections, which is by absentee ballot. In the couple minutes I have left, I'm going to try to answer questions that might be popping up in your minds. First and foremost, why would the Jordanians agree with this? Why would the Hashemite king go along with this plan? And you have to realize that any other plan, or the left-wing plan, the two-state solution, is the, the Hashemite kingdom's biggest nightmare. Biggest nightmare. Already, the, the demographic of Jordan today has 75% Palestinians, and only 20 to 25% uh, Hashemites. So why is it the Hashemite kingdom, or how is it that the Palestinians haven't taken over or taken a majority in their parliament? Because they play games. They play games that are acceptable in international politics. They gerrymander up their state in a way that doesn't allow the Palestinian majority to take uh, control of their parliament. And the West props up the, Pal the Hashemite king, uh, of Jordan and says, that's okay, you continue to play your games, you've been a friend of the West, and even though if there was a true Arab Spring and true elections in, Pal in, in Palestine slash Jordan, in Jordan, the Palestinians would take the day, the, the West is okay with this and the Americans are constantly pumping money into the Jordan King, Jordanian King's uh, treasury. So this is the way that we can uh, twist his arm into being part of the solution. Because up until now, all that the Jordanian king wants is for the Arabs and the Israelis to keep killing each other with no re resolution to the conflict. Because the left-wing resolution to the conflict is his nightmare. If we give the whole, all of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan River to the Palestinian entity who has its own army, he will be flanked, the Jordanian king will be flanked on his western border and on his eastern border with his enemies with a 75% Palestinian re representation in his country. That is his, his biggest nightmare. What we're offering with the Israeli initiative is be part of the pro solution, allow them to vote. We won't uh, move any Palestinians physically into Jordan. They will remain residents of the state of Israel, but their national affiliation will be with you just like it was up until 1988, and you'll be able to continue from the West propping you up and play your gerrymandering games. It won't change anything when it comes to the Jordanian parliament. Um, you might be asking yourselves, why would the Palestinians go along with this? And the truth is that the Palestinian leadership won't, but we have to understand 
the, that the Palestinian leadership feeds off the conflict. Just like the Jordanian king, the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian authority want us to keep killing each other because if there's a resolution to the conflict, they no longer have uh, a, a need to exist. There's no need for Palestinian authority. There's no need for Palestinian leadership. If the Palestinians have become residents of Israel, we raise their standard of living, which will be part of our, uh, part of our challenge. And, uh, but no Palestinian authority, no, no other state besides the state of Israel between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. The Palestinian leadership would never go for this, but we know by surveys that have been done, the Palestinian nation, the ones who have been made to suffer by their leadership for so long, holding out for this pipe dream that could never have existed of them having their own, they really just want to live alongside us, and it makes sense, and we could give them proper lives. And that's why we feel like if this is implemented by the international community, we could give them proper lives, and it would be a true solution, even if their leadership wants us to keep uh, killing each other. And the last is international community. Um, up until now, They've been forcing two-state solution down our throats. But we have a new government in the United States. They're our biggest friends. We think that, they think that President Trump and Vice President Pence are the right men to finally realize that what we've been doing up until now is insane, and we have to move away from the insanity. We have to adopt something that will get us on the right road to peace. Thank you very much.